meeting agenda. I'd like to call the meeting to order and with roll call. Um, Commissioner Chambers. Here. Commissioner Hurt. Here. Uh, Commissioner Siegel. Here. Commissioner Vink. Here. And I am here. So with that, uh, we'll start our meeting. Item two is approval of the agenda. And I'd like to make a motion <clears throat> to move item three, the remote public comments uh, to occur after the commission receives additional information about the noise analysis and reports in recent park survey results. Uh, one of the reasons uh, for that move is one, everyone will have an opportunity to hear the presentations. And also we only have remote public comment at one point uh, on these special meetings. And so if we did it as indicated uh, as item three, uh, we wouldn't have any public comment after we heard the presentations. So with that, I'm looking for a second to uh, make that agenda change. Uh, seconded. Okay, thank you, David. Right, uh, any discussion? If not, uh, Commissioner Chambers? Aye. Commissioner Hurt? Aye. Commissioner Siegel? Aye. Commissioner Vink? Aye. And I vote yes, and I don't believe we have any additional commissioners yet joining. So with that, uh, we will move to item four, the Royal Park continued discussion on neighborhood survey. Dale? Yes, thank you, Chair Ono. So I'm going to, just to go over um, how this presentation is gonna go. First of all, I'm gonna go ahead and do a brief introduction of the item. Um, I'm also gonna make a recommendation that we break out the recommendations um, one and two, and I'll talk about that in a, in in a minute, I go, again, I'll do a brief over of the report. Um, I will then introduce the consultants and they will talk about uh, the methodology and how they conducted their tests. And then after that, then they will take technical questions from the Recreation and Park Commission. Um, and then we will go to public comment. And then this will come back to the Recreation Park Commission for discussion, if that seems logical to everybody. Perfect. Okay, so this evening we are recommending that number one, you receive the information as requested from the noise consultant. Uh, there's two of them actually. Um, as, you're, as you recall, the last meeting you wanted some more information, so we have provided that information. And then secondly, for this one subsection, we are asking you to provide feedback if there's a location in Royal Park that you think is reasonably reasonable to relocate the SkyTrack. So that is part one. And then part two would be uh, selecting equipment to replace the SkyTrack equipment. And uh, if, it, if the SkyTrack is relocated, what equipment would you recommend to the city council to replace in the, the SkyTrack in its current location? So those are the two basically recommendations or four, but basically we're trying to two, talk about two different topics. So um, fiscal impact, so the estimate to remove move the SkyTrack to a new location is about $39,000. The cost to replace and install the replacement equipment ranges between $32,000 and $39,000, depending on which item that the commission feels is the best appropriate um, equipment to be placed in there. The funding for the replacement will, and new equipment will be coming from a combination of park impact fees and general fund. So as you may recall, in March uh, earlier this year, it seems like ages ago right now, uh, we conducted a survey and with, the, uh, thousand, uh, with residents within a thousand feet of Royal Park about the recent and future amenity improvements. So I know you had reviewed the preliminary information at your April meeting. Um, at this meeting, there was much discussion about the SkyTrack and the commissioners who had asked for clarification uh, from the consultant that conducted the AGI um, survey, as well as uh, some other information that you thought would be beneficial for your May meeting discussion. So with that, um, I will go over just a couple things uh, on this. 
both the BAC, which stands for Bollard Acoustical Consultants, and AGI, which is Acoustics Group Incorporated, uh, did analysis, and I did attach those to your packets. I, re I realize it's a lot of hefty reading, but I want to have you have both reports there for you. They were asked to measure and evaluate the SkyTrack noise with the city's noise ordinance standards. Um, with that, um, currently the SkyTrack, as you see in the photo right now, the existing SkyTrack location is in the north-south configuration. Um, if for some, if the SkyTrack is moved, as an example, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So if, for example, the commission feels uh, that choice B, we go to that one, uh, we would recommend, and I think the consultants can do a better job and more eloquently to clarify, we put the SkyTrack in a east-west um, configuration. Um, we could possibly have the DBAs reduced by as much as eight points. Um, this also, if the SkyTrack is also moved to either B or C, it is likely in compliance with the noise ordinance under normal circumstances and conditions uh, or use of the SkyTrack. Um, as per the Recreation Park Commission, you had lots of questions and I included those questions and responses that I took directly from them. And again, you can certainly ask them uh, this evening for more clarification. Um, what Number one, what is LEQ? And that's basically the equivalent of noise uh, energy average. So LEQ is, in other words, is a reasonable interpretation of the code, although it's not clear, uh, and it is something that the city attorney may be able to recommend to be further clarified. There is also some discussion about the difference of the testing. So BAC and AGI did two different types of testing, and they can, again, they'll talk about the methodology. But AGI had multiple users and then used the highest noise source for the analysis. It is also much more vigorous testing compared to the BAC, whereas the BAC, we only had one to two users and no vocalization. Um, AGI had a couple users and they were very exuberant, so there was some human element to that. Um, also, there were some comments from the general public about the health of the trees if we decide to move the sky truck to either B or C. Um, obviously, parks and community services will work very carefully and uh, resourcefully with the Public Works Department, Urban Forestry Division, to make sure that um, if the SkyTrack is located in the either B or C location, that we will make sure we don't intrude on, on, on top of any um, roots or anything else so that the trees remain healthy and viable. Um, as I mentioned, also included in the attachments, uh, for your reference, um, are the two studies. I also put some tables in there that we'll talk about. Um, also on tonight's um, meeting, we also have Paul Ballard, as I mentioned, who I'll introduce in a second. We have Robert Wu, and then we actually have a uh, city attorney, um, Lori Liu, um, and she is with our city attorney's office to have any further uh, clarifications or questions you may have for her. So with that, I'm going to stop here because I think this is the first part of it, and then we can certainly talk about the second part, which is the equipment. But first, I will turn it over to Paul Bollard, and he will talk about um, his methodology and his uh, study that he conducted for us. Uh, Dale, can I ask uh, one very quick question um, for clarification? The 39000 is that to both remove the SkyTrack and uh, uh, install it at one of the other locations, or is that just to remove it? So 39,000 is to remove it and to reinstall it at another location. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Am I up there, Dale? You are, so let me know when you would like to have your graph. We have these two exhibits here first, if that helps, and then we have your other chart that you wanted to have on board as well. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, commissioners. My name is Paul Bollard. I'm with Bollard Acoustical Consultants and our offices in Auburn, California. And uh, in 2019, we were retained by the city to conduct some noise measurements of the SkyTrack um, and to compare those against the city's noise standards. And so we did, we came out and we did monitoring. You can see in the upper left-hand graph there, there's 
NM for noise measurement sites one, two, and three. Uh, NM1 was due south of the SkyTrack at the nearest property line. It was 120 feet from the uh, nearest point of the SkyTrack, the end of it. Um, NM2 was further down to the east a few homes, and it was about 135 feet from the SkyTrack. And NM3 was another site that was just located about 75 feet west of the SkyTrack. We set up three precision noise meters, all of which were certified to be in compliance with national standards. We calibrated them on the site to make sure that the readings were, were completely accurate. And we let those instruments run while both myself and uh, one of my interns that was with me that day uh, operated the SkyTrack. So the meters ran continuously collecting data, um, sampling basically eight times per second for slow meter response and uh, gathering data while we operated the SkyTrack. We didn't have either myself or my intern yelling or uh, vocalizing while we were conducting the measurements because our intent was to isolate the noise of the equipment by itself uh, without yelling. Yelling is a much more variable noise source. Uh, as you can imagine, it varies from person to person and based on how excited they are. So we, the intent of our analysis was to really determine how loud is this piece of equipment in the absence of yelling. Um, yelling is not unique to a sky track at a park. It could happen on playing fields or other play structures or what have you. So that was the, um, the function of our, our sampling. And I'll have Dale, if you don't mind, advancing to the slide that shows our results. So the upper left-hand graph, I know it appears a little bit small in this figure, but these are the second by second noise measurements at the three locations. Um, site one, which is shown um, in green, is the one that was at the nearest property line, 120 feet. Site two is shown in red, and that was just to the east at 135 feet. And site three was the, uh, the blue line on the graph, which were just 75 feet away. And these points rec are these data indicate second by second how much noise was measured um, during the survey period, which extended about eight minutes. And as you can see, the, the first four group, the first four spikes, if you will, toward the left side of the graph, that was me operating the sky track as hard as I could, trying to generate the max amount of noise when the track reached the end of the track, uh, which is where the, the majority of the noise is made when the impact occurs at the end of the run. My intern, um, I'm, I weigh 200 pounds, and my intern was about 115 pounds, and she was operating towards the right side of the graph for, uh, for the data here. And as you can see here, the highest levels that we measured at any time were 55 decibels um, during the survey period, and that was with me operating the track as, as hard as I could. Um, most, of the, most of the data for the property lines, which were the green and the red lines, were below 55. However, there was one that did extend up to the 55 decibel mark. And these are maximum levels. These are instantaneous levels. So these, these don't represent averages. These represent the maximum for the period. If you took the average of this entire duration, and we did that, it computes to about an average of 46 decibels. But as you can see here, the highest levels, um, we're just right at the 55 decibel line. And I know there has uh, been plenty of discussion about whether that 55 decibel line should be an average or a maximum. I can get into that if you would like, but for purposes of tonight's discussion, assuming that 55 decibels in your ordinance is intended to be a maximum value, you can see here that none of the data that we measured uh, with a SkyTrack in its current location exceeded a maximum level of 55 decibels. Now, if the SkyTrack is relocated to position B, for example, it would go from 120 feet to approximately 270 feet away. And we know that sound decreases with distance, and it decreases at a rate of about six decibels each time you double your distance from the source. So if you go from 120 feet back to 270 feet, you're gonna see about a seven to eight decibel decrease in noise just because of the extra distance the sound has to travel. So if we're already starting 
at a maximum level with just the equipment by itself, again, this isn't kids yelling, of 55 decibels for a maximum. And we move this further back, approximately 150 feet further away from the property line, we know that those noise levels are gonna go down by about seven to eight decibels. So we're really looking at levels from 47 to 48 decibels. And those are maximums, maximum levels of the SkyTrack operation um, at the relocated site B. And it's our position that, that that level would clearly be in compliance with the city's noise ordinance standard of 55 decibels. Regardless of whether you look at that 55 decibel standard as an average or as a maximum, um, the maximum levels at the relocated site would be approximately 48 decibels. Average levels at that location would probably be somewhere around 40 decibels based on the data that we collect. So I know I went through that fairly quickly, but um, it's a fairly straightforward synopsis of what we were retained to do. And um, I think I will pause there. I know you've got a lot of information to get to, and I would be happy to entertain any questions you might have. Okay, well, let's hold off on that. If there's any questions and we'll move on to Robert Wu. And Robert is with Acoustics Group Incorporated or AGI. So with that, Robert. Good afternoon, commissioners and staff. Uh, I'm Robert Wu from the Acoustics Group and I'm the principal of the firm. Our firm was tasked with uh, measuring the noise from the SkyTrack and evaluating um, alternative locations for potential relocation. The city had identified three locations for us to perform monitoring. And in December of uh, 2021, we um, went out and we measured the noise from the SkyTrack we used um, three precision sound level meters, calibrated the instruments before the survey, checked the calibration after the survey to ensure accuracy. All the measurements were performed per industry standards and um, uh, consistent with uh, recommendations for microphone height, et cetera. Unlike uh, Mr. Bollard's uh, survey, we requested multiple users for the um, SkyTrack operation because we felt like there could be some variability in the noise produced by the user, especially user groups by age. So we ended up making measurements of um, uh, kids on the swing in the seat, adults pushing kids, adults on the swing in the seat, and teens on the swing in the seat. And as a result of the measurement, the, um, the sound levels, the energy average sound levels are shown in table two. Um, the highest noise was produced by teenagers on the seat and on the swing. And those measured sound levels included vocalization. Now we never asked for the um, operators to either shout or not shout. We wanted them to just use the equipment as how they perceive they normally would. Uh, we didn't wanna skew the results. We just simply want to measure and take as much data as possible and then identify the highest noise sources. Using the data from the noise sources, we would ultimately use that to calibrate our computer modeling for the evaluation of alternative locations. But based on the measurement data um, at the location NM1 and NM2, we uh, were able to determine that the noise levels exceeded the LEQ noise limit of 55 dBA at both NM1 and NM2 when compared to an LMAX standard of 75 dBA, the sound levels would be in compliance, clearly in compliance. So our next step was to use the noise from the um, teenagers and calibrate our computer model. 
Once we entered that data into the model, the model calibrated to within two tenths of a decibel, which is extremely accurate for a computer model. Uh, the model is uh, called the Canada Acoustical Model, and it um, is based on ISO 9613 uh, acoustical propagation algorithms. So this model is a industry recognized model and the um, results of the model have been uh, validated through years and years of applications and verifications. So in a nutshell, we, we looked at moving the um, sky track to alternative locations A, B, C, and D, which are somewhat in the center of the park in a north-south alignment. But each of those A, B, and C, and D locations span from the east to uh, west to the east directions. Uh, having run the models, we're able to determine uh, that if you were to locate the sky track at locations B and D, B and C, you would nominally um, comply with the LEQ noise limit of 55 dBA, and you would clearly uh, comply with the um, maximum noise limit of 75 dBA for the hours from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, the reduction of moving the sky track from the current location to the uh, B or C locations is about a seven to eight dBA reduction. And that's consistent with Mr. Bollard's um, calculations. Staff, could you please move the slide back again so that uh, commissioners can see which areas that uh, Mr. Wu is talking about? And then Robert, let us know when you want the other graph on there as well. Thank you. Yeah, let's go ahead and go to the plot of our measurement data. So here's an excerpt of our measurement data as a function of time. And what we've circled are the two highest noise sources that we use for our modeling. Each of these um, measurements and circled sources include the contribution of uh, user shouting and sky track noise. Um, it's important to note that even after our testing, we still receive fairly high levels of kids talking, um, dog barking. Uh, those, those sound levels in case of the dog is clearly uh, almost 80 dBA, but it wasn't uncommon to see ch uh, kids talking to be above 60 dBA. So this is what's being showed at location NM1. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that our measurements at location NM2. So in conclusion, you know, based on the results of our analysis, uh, re relocation of the sky track to locations uh, B or C would get you to a point of compliance with the 55 dBA LEQ standard, as well as reduce the uh, maximum noise levels below the 75 dBA limit. Okay, thank you, Robert. So at this time, I will ask uh, if commissioner or the chair can Recognize commissioners, I'm sure that this will be an opportunity for technical questions and clarification. Thank you, Dales. <clears throat> uh, if commissioners would raise their hands if they have technical questions. I see uh, Commissioner Herb. Yeah, I just want to be crystal clear about something. Leave that chart up, please, uh, about Mr. Uh, Wu just said. So on the right hand side, and where you've got labeled kids talking loudly, kids talking loudly. Um, 
the, that is without any operation of the of the sky track whatsoever. That's just the sound of kids talking loudly in the park. Is that correct? Yes. What we can, could not control was um, people walking by the sound level meters or other activities occurring at the park. Sure, sure. The ordinary noises that you get from park activities. Exactly. So what you see here was multiple um, instances of uh, a teen on a seat or a teen on a swing so that we could get a clean data uh, and get the highest data for that specific uh, user. And even when we are done with uh, our survey, our instruments continue to run and you see the contribution from other sources. Now, uh, these other sources could be close to the uh, sound level meter or they sure. could be further away, but the sound level is what it is. It's what was measured at that particular location. So at what point in this chart that we're looking at, is it about the midpoint? where your, your uh, equipment is continue, continuing to record even after you've uh, uh, ceased your demonstrations? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that question. We continue to run after we finish our measurements at about four o'clock, we um, proceeded to stop our instruments and collect the yeah that's what i mean i not i just now see it it's a very tiny type at the bottom so four o'clock is is pretty much at the midpoint of of the graph that we're seeing yes and for this particular location from about four o'clock to 4 11 p.m there's 11 minutes where we continue to acquire data that we didn't use in our analysis but it's just presented here Okay, that, that's, uh, that, that gives us an interesting comparison. Um, also, to, to either one of the, uh, of the uh, consultants, I'd like to get back a little bit to this maximum average issue. I know it, it's, it's obviously somewhat technical and somewhat confusing, but looking at the ordinance, the ordinance refers to a noise level, uh, which, uh, you know, obviously if your uh, instruments are recording, what, eight times per second, there is obviously a lot of modulation with when you're, when you're, when you're splitting time into down in those small units. So when you get the, that LEQ, uh, reading or, or, or number that you present, that is by necessity an, an average, is it not, of the, over, that, over that time period broken down into, into very small increments? Paul, you wanna go first or should I go first? No, I'll jump in there. Um, Commissioner, that's absolutely correct. It, it'd be the individual spikes just so they show the instantaneous levels on the graph that are happening very rapidly. The average, if you were to just essentially convert those spikes into energy values, because you can't add decibels directly, but if you, essentially the LEQ is the average of that data that, um, uh, that Robert is showing here in this graph. And so, that, I'll add that. so basically the LEQ is designed to show a continuous what it would sound like over a continuous period of time. You're correct, absolutely correct. Through the benefit of modern instrumentation, all this is being calculated and performed inside the sound level meter. So it gives you a number on the screen. Um, Paul and I will remember back a long time ago where things were digital and you actually had to uh, write down the number or get it as it was coming off the instrument. And then you would go back to your office and calculate the energy of each of the events and sum it up to calculate the LEQ. Well, um, uh, yeah, technology has made all of our jobs a little easier. Um, okay, and that's all for now. I, uh, I may have more later. Thank you. Commissioner Siegel? 
I guess I'm still puzzled by this notion of average. The average would include, or doesn't include, periods when the sky tract is actually not running, you know, in between, right? In other words, I'm not, when I say average to me, if I'm, let's say I'm looking at, I don't know what average blood pressures, uh, it's sort of, a, the blood pressure is a continuous measurement. It's not, people have blood pressures all the time. It's not intermittent, but the sky track is running and then stopping, running and stopping. And this is being measured, I think, as you said, eight times per second. So I'm not sure how you get an average or, or is it only operational during the running of the sky track? That's sort of the first question. The, the other question, which maybe somebody could help me with this, is the, the I understand the ordinance is, is written to um, discuss maximum, not average, which to me, may, frankly, makes sense. I mean, you're interested in maximum noise, not average noise. Uh, something that would, let's say, jolt me out of sleep or something would be a loud noise, not an average noise. Um, so you guys, are you familiar with whether or not when you measure this and you call it average, and I get that you're measuring sound levels eight times per second, but again, does this include the period when the sky tract is actually not running, or is this this only when the sky tract is actually running? That's the first thing, and and the second thing is, what is your interpretation of the city ordinance? Robert, you want to go ahead? Yes, um, through the benefits of modern technology, what you see here is an illustration of the data as it's being sampled. But what we are able to do is come back to our office and post-process the data. So we essentially look for the highest source and we cut out everything else in between. So when the SkyTrack is not operating, the other acoustical data is not used in our calculations. We're only using the contribution from the um, sky track and shout in the calculation of the LEQ. I see. So it's an average, it's an average noise level when the sky track is actually uh, being run. Correct. Not, not in between. Correct. And you, somehow you're able to adjust for that. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And that that's what makes the analysis peer <laughs> and conservative <laughs> that we're using only the set the, the noise created from the sky track and the snout in the um, alternative uh, locations analysis. Okay. And the other thing is I, I want to piggyback on something that uh, Commissioner Hurst said, and again, I'm a little bit unclear of this. When we look at this, this uh, graph that you presented, I believe it's figure two or whatever it is, um, you, what you, I think what you're saying, just to be clear, is that the loudest noise is produced by uh, people yelling when the sky tract is not operational. Is that, is that correct? Is that, is that what uh, uh, Tim said? And you verified that, that actually the sky tract doesn't produce the, the loudest, the maximum noise. In fact, it's yelling when sky tract's not being used. No, that's not correct. The loudest noise that we observed from our measurement survey was when there was uh, use of the sky track was simultaneous shouting. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. I wasn't quite clear on that point. And then the second part of your question, could you repeat that again, please? Well, as I said, I think, I think Frank, your knowledge of the ordinance is that what this, the ordinance focuses on is maximal noise, not average noise. In other words, the violation of the of the ordinance would be above a certain level, not above, not an average above that level. Yeah. So section. I'll ask maybe if uh, our city attorney would like to maybe do the interpretation and talk about that, Lori. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Dale. Um, good evening, commissioners. Uh, my name is Lori Liu. I'm with the city attorney's office. And uh, Commissioner Siegel, as to your question about the interpretation of the ordinance, um, 
we believe it is um, a reasonable interpretation to that it is looking at LEQ or average. However, um, we do acknowledge that there is um, some lack of clarity. It's not specifically written into the ordinance, whether it's LEQ or LMAX. And so for that reason, uh, we would recommend that the city consider um, clarifying the ordinance, um, perhaps through an amendment so that we can get some clarity on exactly how it is being measured. Okay, thank you. Thank you, David. I, I actually had a couple of questions. Um, this one might be for city staff. Has the LAQ been used um, for other park facilities as a um, guideline for noise? Or is this the first time that it's been used? I will stay, and, and Paul can assist as well too. We also did a study regarding the Slide Hill pickleball courts and tennis courts. And, and Paul, LAQ you... was the standard? So if I could maybe just interject here, we've been uh, doing noise analyses in the city of Davis, I have for, for 34 years and we recognize that the ordinance is, is the, the way it is written, it's a bit ambiguous. It doesn't specifically say whether it's an average or a maximum, this 55 dB number. However, if the 55 is truly a maximum, um, you can start your car in the morning or pull out of your driveway without exceeding that maximum noise level at your next door neighbor's house. Um, you couldn't approve a loading dock in the city or a car wash or anything if the 55 is the maximum. When you speak, you speak to your person three to five feet away from you at a level of approximately 65 decibels. So from a practical standpoint, and we've been doing noise studies in Davis for years and years, we've interpreted it as this 55 is intended to be an average and the maximum during daytime hours is 75, which is in included in the ordinance this 20 decibel offset because it just physically doesn't work to set a maximum noise level standard of 55. In fact, the state of California, they have a model community noise ordinance that is used to assist cities and counties in writing their noise ordinances. And their daytime standard is an average of 55. So um, we recognize that the wording here is ambiguous, but from a practical standpoint, we've always treated it as an average. We've done noise studies in the city that have been approved using 55 as an average and using 75 as a maximum. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Vink. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> uh, something that Mr. Baller just said, uh, I, I don't see anywhere, I, I looked at the uh, zoning ordinance uh, because I wanted to read it. I'm assuming I found the correct version of it. It's on a website that appears to have uh, city zoning ordinance codes, uh, or maybe it's just an ordinance, not a zoning ordinance, but ordinance codes from throughout the state. I don't see anywhere in that code where it says anything about a maximum is 20 decibels greater than a measured sound. I, I think it is true that the wording of the ordinance is perhaps a little um, open for interpretation, but it clearly says, the table says maximum noise level. It doesn't say maximum average, it says maximum. And with all respect to our as uh, acoustic expert, I don't think he's an expert in ordinances. And so I would uh, love to hear the city attorney speak to that. Um, I appreciate that that might be how uh, acoustic engineers do their work, but we're dealing with a very specific wording and a very specific ordinance here in our city. And I just want to be clear on that because it's not true. And if I'm mistaken, I would like to be uh, shown how I'm mistaken that there's anything in this city's ordinance that says a maximum is 20 decibels above a sound. 
Commissioner, I can um, just reiterate what I stated before that the city's interpretation has been to look at the average. Um, and it's like, like we said, it's, it's, there may be, it may be unclear and that's, that's exactly why we would recommend that it be clarified um, in the ordinance. Um, but that, that seems to be, you know, what, what makes sense, what practically speaking, like the, like the uh, experts have stated. And so, you know, our, the city's position is that it, it is not clear, yet it is a reasonable interpretation uh, based on practice and based on other situations that it would be an average, not a maximum. And that the maximum, even though it doesn't state maximum, it's, I mean, even though it states maximum in the table, that's a maximum of the average readings that have been taken. And that, that, is, that is the interpretation that we believe is, is one that is reasonable. So like I said, we're, we're happy to recommend that it be clarified. Um, and it, you know, I understand that it is arguable or open to interpretation, um, but that's exactly why we think that perhaps the best step would be to, to simply amend the ordinance to clarify that it is an average. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, no, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, so that, that comment earlier about 20 additional decibels really doesn't have any relevance here in this discussion. Mr. Chair. Yeah. Yes, uh, Council Member uh, Carson. Just to clarify, I'd ask the city attorney to look at Municipal Code 24.02.030, titled Maximum Noise Limit, which the first sentence says, no person shall produce, suffer, or allow to be produced in any location a noise level of more than 20 dBA above the limit, but not greater than 80 dBA on table number one measured at the property plane. So okay. there is a reference there to 20. Got it. Thank you. I appreciate that, Councilman. Thank you. And yes, we are aware of that provision of the ordinance um, 0 0.030 dealing with the maximum noise limit and consistent with what I stated earlier that we believe that there is some am ambiguity um, about how that how that is enforceable and what that specific provision means. Commissioner Hurt. Yeah, I want to get back and, and, and ask the uh, the city attorney again. I keep coming back to this terminology of noise level uh, in the ordinance, and to me, a level is by definition an average. Uh, I mean, it, 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 I mean, do you think there's a a, a difference between um, the word level and average? Um, in the, in, in, the, in the statute or in the ordinance? I'd have to take a closer look at the language of the ordinance um, to see what exactly you're referring to. But I, I think as to level or sound or average, I think that might be um, a question more appropriate for the, the sound study experts because they're the ones that typically you know, work with those terms. Well, sure, they're, 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 they're welcome to, to uh, contribute. You know, it's, it's Paul Bollard again. It's not uncommon for most cities to have both, to have an average standard and a maximum standard. And if you think about it this way, say you have a swimming pool pump that generates a steady state level that's not changing over time, and it runs for an entire hour. And the average for that hour, provided it's below 55 at the property line or the nearest neighbor, would be satisfactory with that it would easily satisfy a 75 decibel maximum level because that swimming pool pump just generates a steady state of 55, for example. Whereas a barking dog, for example, might not bark, but a few times out of the hour, or let's say an auto repair facility where they're changing tires and the impact wrenches aren't going continuously, but when they do go, they generate these higher maximum levels. So it's very common for cities and counties to have both averages and maximums um, to handle those situations. I'd like to add that um, the purpose of the noise ordinance is allow a um, coexistence of operations and uh, receivers. So the reason you have an average noise uh, LEQ 
at El Max is so that you can have some activities that create um, higher noises, but over time they average out just as long as you don't have uh, specific events that exceed the maximum. Mr. Chair. Yes, Councilman Carson again. Yes. So I would also urge uh, the city attorney to read the definitions in the ordinance 24.01.020. The definition of noise level is defined in the ordinance that noise level means the maximum continuous sound level or repetitive peak level produced by a sound source or group of sources as measured with a type S2A or better sound level meter using the A switch weighing scale and the meter response function set to slow. The language about continuous, I think, is helps to distinguish the underlying sound levels from the maximum that's 20 decibel levels above. The, I don't see how the one about 20 above makes the slightest sense if the first one is an absolute maximum as opposed to an average. It, the, the two components of the ordinance make no sense whatsoever unless you read all of these definitions and provisions together, which is the way they were written. Just, just me, and I'm not an attorney. Thank you. Commissioner Siegel. Yeah, I'm still struggling with this notion of average. So if you do 100 measurements, and you get a you sum up the total number of decibels and you divide by 100 you'll get a certain number correct uh, but if let's say only five of those measurements are extremely high let's say 100 decibels but in between there's no sound or there's very little sound you'll get an average that's quite low now again i, I how you the definition of how you determine an average how many readings over what period of time, I think is, is very uh, important. Again, I'm, I'm not a mathematician, but I would think that the notion of average, uh, I think one of the consultants gave some very good examples. Yes, if you have a, a pump for a pool that is making a certain amount of sound, it's constant. So that average is going to be the same as the maximum. But on the other hand, if you have a, tire store where intermittently there's very loud noise uh, but in between there's no noise or very little noise that average is going to be probably quite low so i to me it's important that we figure out what it means and whether we're talking about average or maximum and maximum during what period of time yes i certainly understand the need for commerce and certain sounds to permit certain activities, but it's it sort of the, the devil to me seems to be in the details there between average and maximum and how you determine the average noise level. Maybe, I don't know if that's, uh, maybe uh, 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 City Councilman Carson knows in his reading of the uh, various uh, Davis uh, provisions, whether or not they sort of deal with how an average is determined. It seems that the average is determined in this case only when the sky track is operational. At least that's what our consultants told us. It's not the in-between downtime. And that seems reasonable. I hope it's, uh, I hope it's accurate. Um, but uh, I think, again, I'm not sure what this average means unless it's defined in great detail. Well, Mr. Commissioner, I'd like to respond by um, letting you know that the analysis we performed um, assumed a continuous um, sky track and shouting activity. There was zero downtime in the analysis. So it's a very conservative analysis where the sound level that was predicted does not diminish or reduce down because there's periods where there's no or very low noise activity. We assumed continuous operations in our noise analysis to arrive at a conservative assessment. Commissioner Morigo. 
Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, I'm looking at all of these with the shout and sky track. I'm assuming that's when it's coming to an end or in the middle of the ride. Is there any on here that is literally just the sky track itself? Um, I know I came in a little bit late, but I was just wondering, looking at this graph, I don't see where it's the sky track by itself. Say somebody just throws it down the track. So Robert, I don't know if you have that data to present. Um, in our figure earlier in the presentation, when we did our monitoring, it was just the sky track. There was no shouting going on. We were collecting our data. So I don't know if that would be useful, um, but I'll let Robert jump in here. <laughs> if I can just say one before we go on, I mean, kids, kids shouting and playing, I mean, to me, that's a good noise. Um, but a, a sky track, you know, going back and forth to me, that that's, that's the noise that I want to look at kids, kids having fun is that's, that's what we want. Yeah. We were able to measure just one measurement of the sky track without shouting and it's slightly lower than, uh, Bollard's, uh, BAC's report. So I would suggest we go back to the slide. Paul's data, which was the highest noise uh, from just the sky track mechanical equipment. Dale, can you go back to that slide? There you go. I'll, I'll jump back in here, um, Commissioner. So this slide represents the monitoring simultaneously from three locations. And these are without any kids yelling. These are just the track by itself sort of banging into the end when it comes to a stop, when it reaches the bumper at the end. There was no yelling or anything. The first four biggest spikes were myself on the sky track going as hard as I could, and I weighed 200 pounds. And then the, the back half was my, um, my technician, my intern, and she was about 115 pounds. So this represents the... You can see the spikes really clearly indicate when the track hit the end of its path, uh, particularly when I was riding it. So these highest levels, these 55 decibel levels that you see there on the left, those are maximum noise levels. That's the loudest the sky track was by itself with no yelling, no kids yelling at any time during the use of the sky track. Yes, it was lower in periods when the track was either halfway between one end or the other and not banging into the, the stops, but these represent the maximums. And I kind of want to just quickly go back and say that even if the, the 55 decibel number is interpreted as a maximum standard in L max, which I, I don't believe is the appropriate interpretation, but even if it were, this data indicates that the sky track by itself is essentially currently in compliance in its current location. And if you relocate it another 150 feet further from the property line, it's gonna be about eight decibels below the maximums that we're seeing here, or approximately 48. So whether it's an average or a maximum, the 55 number, with the relocated sky track, both numbers are gonna be below that 55 decibel number. I'm not sure if that answers your question, Commissioner. No, that totally answers my question. That's what I was looking for. Thank you. Are there any other commissioner uh, questions? If not, we'll go, go ahead and move to public comment. If city staff could get uh, prepared for that. So, Give us a minute and then we'll go ahead and get you and then we'll call you out by name. Right. Uh, we have received some written comments that were sent to RPC at cityofdavis.org. Uh, and those were distributed uh, if they were uh, received uh, before 4.30 p.m. Um, you could still send correspondence as well. We have live remote public comments. Uh, if you can raise your hand or press star nine, you'll give, be given three minutes, we ask that speakers uh, state their name for the record. Hi, we do have a first comment. 
Public comment from Joe Carvoza. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Um, a couple of things with all due respect to Mr. Bollard and Mr. Wu, uh, hearing everything you've said here today indicates to me that you really have a very little understanding of how the zip track is absolutely, is actually operated. And I'm very serious about this, Mr. Bollard. I don't appreciate the smile. It is an adult with two young children throwing them simultaneously back and forth on the track that results in the loud noise. Neither of you tested for that. Neither of you understand that. And if any of you had been listening to us as we've been complaining, you'd understand that. So these tests are not valid on their face. Second, um, it's, it's unfathomable to me that attachment three that all of the commissioners have for this meeting that shows the LMAX data has not been discussed to this point. Uh, there's the LMAX numbers. Those are the LMAX numbers that Mr. Wu's firm collected that were not uh, included in the 40 page report. And for that to be hidden is just absolutely uh, unbelievable. So I wanna make sure it's clear that everybody understands it is not ambiguous. It says maximum. Maximum means maximum. You can measure with LMAX, which is maximum, or you can measure with LEQ, which is an average. So if it says maximum, you need to measure with maximum. If somebody wants to make the argument that somehow maximum doesn't mean maximum, they can change the ordinance. That's not an ambiguity. The idea that the pickleball was analyzed with an average tells me that all of those citizens were really misled and that really should have never happened. And it's very unfortunate. Um, I'm very pleased that staff didn't have the sound consultants pass uh, judgment on what the interpretation of the ordinance would be by and large. Uh, that needs to go back to council. You need to go to council. Now council was asked last May to change maximum to average and they declined to do so. So it's completely inappropriate now for the Rec and Park Commission to get involved in this. The council has decided not to do this. They didn't do it. And so you're at maximum, which it says. So I think this needs to go back to council. You shouldn't make any recommendation until it's clear. I also wanna point out that in the Bollard study, just as uh, Mr. Siegel has pointed out, if you look at the graph, the first one that was put up, it's somewhere between one and a half and two and a half minutes where there's very light use on it. And of course that brings the average way down. But if you even took the average while an adult is throwing two children at the ends back and forth, then you're gonna get a very high average, even if you're still using average and the maximums are gonna be much higher. So I don't think that the max Next public comment is from Alan Miller. Hi, this is Alan Miller, District 3. Um, just wanted to point out several things. I did send a um, comment, didn't realize it had to be in by 4.30. I sent it at 5.12. I hope you all will read what I wrote. It's also in the data site. Um, it's very important to keep in mind that there's always this idea of if you don't uh, want to hear airplanes, don't move in at the end of a runway. Well, nobody moved in next to a zip track um, and nobody was expecting that somebody was going to build an airport in the park behind them. This affects the people nearby and it affects them forever and always. Um, I have health issues that have to do with hearing. I have, a, um, I have something called hyperacusis, which is caused by nerve damage in one of my ears. I've become very familiar with health issues regarding noise, and it is largely peak damaging sounds 
it cause the health problems? It certainly does for my condition. And my condition is what my ear doctor called one of the most undiagnosed conditions there are. But one of the things that I think people fail to understand is that hearing conditions are tied in with brain interpretation of what um, your ear sends to your brain. And the, the reason I bring that up is because it isn't just about being annoyed by sound. For many of us, it is actually a health condition that, that causes this. It can actually make certain sounds, certain levels, certain frequencies debilitating. And that needs to be taken into consideration. Another thing to take into consideration is that a lot of people work at home now and their home is their office and they need to be able to work undisturbed. That's the new reality. Also the sound clank is not a sound that most of us want to hear despite, I don't know who said it, but something about kids screaming is what we want to hear. I don't, I don't want to hear that. Um, and so mainly keep in mind that it's the peaks that are damaging for those of us with health problems, and it's the peaks that are the biggest problem. So don't make it average. Thanks. Next public comment is from Colin Walsh. Uh, good evening, uh, commissioners. Uh, thank you for hearing my comment. Uh, I'm the uh, currently the chair of the tree commission, but I'm speaking here for myself. My first request would be that any recommendation you make uh, with this tonight uh, includes a recommendation that the tree commission look at the placement and impact on the trees. Thank you for uh, considering that. Uh, secondly, I want to note that it was very uh, challenging to get into the meeting tonight because the uh, address that was posted online tonight is not the actual address and I was uh, emailed the address later so I missed the first part of the meeting, uh, which may cause a problem with any decisions you make tonight uh, in the future. Uh, but to get to the meat of the subject, the question tonight seems to be, uh, does max mean max or not? And there's a couple ways to look at this. Um, you could assume that it means average, or you could assume that it means max, as it is on the, on the, the face of it. Uh, you have some, in, you know, interpretations before you that suggest, you know, that it might be one or the other. Um, but I, I really think it is quite telling that the this noise ordinance was attempted to be rewritten and was put on a council agenda uh, to change the word max to average, and then it was pulled. So if it was meant to mean, you know, if it, if it was not meant to mean max, why did they need to change it and then not change it? So maybe there's problems with the ordinance. Maybe the ordinance isn't perfectly written, but it's not up to the commission tonight, in my opinion, to rewrite the ordinance. Um, so when this comes to making a decision tonight, um, what I would suggest is if in doubt, take the conservative path. And there's plenty of reason to be in doubt here of what is actually meant in the ordinance. And so the conservative path would be to not just move the zip track within the park, uh, because it, it may be a problem. So I would urge you to take the conservative path tonight. Thank you so much for your time.
Next public comment is from Karen Fairgraves. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak tonight. My name is Karen Fairgraves. Um, the locations for B and C are very near the levels set forth um, for the residences. And when you, we've heard a lot of talk about if you move it away from one site, it would lower the DBAs, but that then does bring it closer to another site, which raises the DBAs that it comes closer to. We've also heard it mentioned that instead of going a north-south, we would move it east-west. Um, and in doing that, the north-south locations would lower by, we've heard, seven to eight DBAs. I would think it would stand to reckon then that the nor or that the east west would increase by seven to eight dbas that then puts the east prop residences at the east property line for locations b and c over 50 dbas matter of fact c would put it right up to 55 dbas in addition it would also increase the sound for the pool um, and and um, probably even louder for the new picnic structure that was recently approved. Now at the pool, you have employees. Um, lifeguards cannot wear hearing protection. <laughs> that would defeat the purpose of being lifeguards. Um, and you also have practices occurring at the pool. Those practices use whistles and coaches are verbalizing to their um, kids. Uh, and with the increase in the ambient noise, the noise surrounding them, the whistles and the voices would increase. I could see them needing to use devices to help amplify their voices. And that would increase then the overall noise level again of the park. And I don't know if any of those things have been considered, um, but certainly when we talk about moving things around, we do have to take into account all of the conditions surrounding the whole area and not just certain positions within the park or residences on one side of the park or other areas of the park that have to be considered. Um, and also wanted to make sure that everybody understood that locking it at night, which is still being considered um, and probably necessary would increase the maintenance costs because vandalism does happen and it does get locked. Um, and that has been mentioned by city staff. So it would have an ongoing maintenance cost as well. Thank you very much. Next public comment is from David Johnson. David, you just need to unmute. Sorry. Sorry. Mr. Chairman and members, David Johnson, 50 year resident of Davis, California. The key thing, members, to look at is the Davis noise ordinance. The Davis, uh, the industry standards are not the law. They may be an industrial practice, but they're not the law. So you have to look closely at the wording of the law. The words LEQ, and average are nowhere to be seen in the Davis ordinance. They're not there. The words maximum and DBA are the operative terms of the Davis noise, noise ordinance. And I have to disagree with the city attorney. It's not ambiguous. It's right there in front of you that the words DBA and maximum are the operative terms. And I think the key thing for members of, of your commission to do is to follow the law. And I'd like to repeat, industry standards and practices are not the law. Thank you. Next public comment is from Janet Carvoza. Hi, 
Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, this is Janet. Um, I wanted to add a few things. Um, one, I, um, one, I've been doing a lot of research into this, not surprisingly, and um, uh, uncovered a, a, re a survey that was produced in 2016. They surveyed the city ordinances for about 500 cities, um, and only 40 of them, or 40, I think it was 40 of that number, actually use LEQ in their uh, statements. The rest of them use nuisance. They use how many feet away you can hear it. Um, so it's, it's clear that every community has taken it upon themselves to find out, to figure out what they want as a community to be the, um, the prevailing ordinance. Uh, in Davis, it's maximum. There's just no question about it. It says maximum. Whoever approved the ordinance when it was approved in the 90s or whenever clearly um, interpreted maximum as just that. And, and there was no has never been any comment regarding it being an average until the um, noise consultants introduced that concept. Um, and as was pointed out a year ago, the city uh, or the city staff attempted to um, to change the ordinance so that it would say average. And that was um, that was pulled at the last minute and uh, that has not gone forward. So at a minimum, this um, ordinance needs to be clarified before the uh, Recreation and Parks Commission can make any determination tonight about where the um, where this, uh, the uh, zip track might be relocated. And I did want to say to um, the new uh, uh, commissioner, Tony Marigo, I hope I'm saying your name right. Um, when you were out looking at the um, uh, device, uh, when you first came out to check it out a few weeks ago, um, I, I don't, I'm 99% sure it was you. Um, I think you were pushing the, um, the little mechanism that the swing would hang from back and forth. And we're in our kitchen and we're going, who's on the zip track? I mean, just the little bit of force that you were using, we could hear it through our own whole house. Um, yeah, uh, a few days ago, some kids were out there doing the same thing, pushing that mechanism back and forth. There's no swing on it, no body weight, and yet we could hear it resoundingly throughout our house. And I know there's also a nuisance um, component of the sound ordinance as well. Uh, I also wanted to kind of see what Paul Ballard um, means by he operated it. It sounds like he was sitting in it. Um, and as my husband pointed out, what really um, is makes the, the giant, the big noises and which is really, really common is for a dad or parents to have both going at once and to be swinging their four-year-old um, as hard as they can uh, to make the, that four-year-old as excited as possible. We have no problem with kids screaming. I wanna say that we love the sound of kids yelling, laughing. We don't like the sound of the metal scraping and banging as I can hear every day, whenever it happens, it just disturbs you doing dishes, doing um, housework, doing paying bills, writing emails. It, it, it's absolutely, um, it's, it's huge, hugely impactful on our lives. There's no other raise hands at this time for public comment. Thank you. Let's let's move forward with general discussion among commissioners. Commissioner Vink. Yeah, uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's really just a clarifying question at this point, but. Um, I forgot to ask at the time, I wanted to hear all the presentations, but this idea of orienting the zip track in an east-west as opposed to a north-south, um, I just wonder if uh, uh, Mr. Bollard and, or Mr. Wu or both can opine on that and or, or maybe if the city staff can talk about why that's being suggested. Does that have to do with um, the, the direction of the noise and it's less audible if it's oriented that way. I will defer to Paul and to Robert on this one. Robert, I think that was your suggestion originally. Do you mind taking that one? Yeah, I think the directionality um, of the mechanics and it being a linear ride if you were to orient it in the east-west, it would reduce some of the noise in the north and south direction. Um, where the one of the commenters indicated that it potentially would result in an increase in the east-west direction. And 
That's true. That our analysis shows that it would not be a uh, large enough increase to cause an exceedance of the LEQ and LMAX standards. Commissioner sure Hurt. Yeah, I, at this point, I just have one quick additional technical question to make sure I understand this right. Both the consultants have agreed that at the center of the park location, the, uh, the noise level at the, at the, the, the points that were measured uh, would be, I believe, six, seven, or eight decibels lower than what it is now. And, and so it's not an, am I correct? This is not an arithmetic thing. In other words, 49 decibels is not 2% quieter than 50%, but it's, a, it, it, it's, it's not an arithmetic calculation. Is that correct? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here. Commissioner, that, that's exactly correct. So a, a three decibel change is, is sort of considered the, the threshold of perception where you perceive a difference. A five decibel change is considered clearly noticeable decrease. And a 10 decibel change is, is considered to be about a halving of loudness. So by relocating it, we're predicting about an eight decibel decrease because of the extra distance. So it would be between a clearly noticeable decrease and a having of loudness. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure I was correct. In that. For sure, Siegel. Right, so let me, let me get this straight. Um, I believe on your graph or table, you showed that for teenagers, the noise level was anywhere from 72 to 81 decibels. Uh, is that correct? There were different age groups. There were adults, there were teenagers, and so on. The, teen, the, the teenager, the teenager uh, level, which I believe was on the lower right of the of the table, was seventy two to eighty one for different activities on that. If we can bring up table two of my report, the acoustics group report. We can um, uh, discuss about individual sources. No, you know it's funny. I think it was a, it was a. This is a obviously a graph. There was a table that had numbers on it, if I recall correctly. There you go. That's it. Yes. So it says <clears throat> teenage kid sit. Uh, you know my eyes are not. I hate to say it, but this little small. But anyway, it's seventy two point six or seventy two point zero. Yes. And, and then, then, there's, um, then it goes up, it, it varies, but basically, I guess there's a, a 69, I think I see, um, uh, but it goes up to 81. Is that right? T 81 is teenage kid swing one foot away from track or something like that. That's 81 decibel, 81.1 decibels, correct? Correct. That's measured at a distance of one foot from the source. And that data was entered into the computer model yeah. and calibrated so that when we ran the model, um, the predicted noise level was within two tenths of what we measured. So that right. ensured the accuracy of the model. But what the table is showing is that the highest noise that was measured from SkyTrack and vocalization was right. as high as 81.4 dBA at a distance of one feet from the track when a teenage kid was on the seat. Right, right. So what So what would that level, what would that number be in terms of the sur surrounding houses? I guess I'm, uh, I'm trying to focus on 81.4 is certainly a number that we haven't, we've been discussing, keep discussing 55, but here's 81.4. Yes. So what, what is the level that somebody in the surrounding, the closest houses would experience? Well, clearly this, below this is, 55. If you can bring up the 
um, sound level results from our noise study report, um, not the graphs, but in the report, you'll see that the sound levels would be below 55 at the residential <laughs> boundaries. I see. So the 81.4 is one foot away. Yes. From, so if you the, from the individual. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. If you extrapolate from one foot to 270 feet, you'll get a reduction that reduces the noise down below 55 dBA LEQ and below 75 dBA LMAX. Right. So where do you get the number 270? If I may ask. That's because... the approximate distance from location B to the southern boundary. Okay, so now we're talking about location B, not the current location. Not the current location. Correct. That, okay, so you're confusing me because we're now we're going to what if we moved it to location B? Currently, can... where the current sky track is. Is how far away from the houses? I think I remember a number like 70 or 80 feet, something like that. But Robert, can you also explain on the same table, if you look at NM1 and NM2, that's where the houses are, correct? So the yeah. kid, uh, one, 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 if a teenage kid on the same thing for 81, um, it would be 50.4 or 49.5, depending on the residents. David, so if you see those. I do see that. I didn't, I didn't see a footnote that explained what NM1 or NM2 was, but. Yeah, that, that goes back to the locations uh, of the previous slide with the red marks. And those were where the sounds uh, were getting tested from. I see, okay. So I see now NM1 and NM2. Okay, that's, that's, that's helpful. So basically what you're saying is one foot away would be 80 something, low 80s. But in fact, that NM1 and NM2 would be more like in the 40s. Okay. Yeah, I believe that distance is nominally about 120 feet. What's 120 feet? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. The distance from the existing SkyTrack location <laughs> to location NM1. I see, 120 feet. I see. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from commissioners? I had one question for council member Carson. Um, I'm not familiar with um, any discussion on the ordinance at city council. Is there anything that you might be able to share with commissioners if there was a discussion of, of modifying the ordinance to clarify average versus maximum. Uh, was that a discussion that? It did not, that discussion did not reach city council. There was a staff proposal um, that was pulled back and that was quite some time ago. Um, and so that, that never was discussed by council. Thank you. All right, well, we're at the end of our general discussion. Is there a motion that any commissioner would like to make in this regard? Dale, I, I did have one question. Is there anything um, time sensitive about these, about the selection of where we place uh, the sky track and, and what equipment goes in its place? Um, time sensitive. It takes eight to 12 weeks to order equipment. So we're looking at probably late summer, early fall for equipment. Um, meanwhile, the sky track is remaining closed and non accessible. So it'd be nice to put something else at least in that existing location. Uh, so that is an option for you. But obviously, um, we probably do need to get some sort of attention or a recommendation from uh, the commission at this point in time. Um, if you would like to choose an alternative location for the SkyTrack, you're more than welcome to. Um, obviously, you have received the information as requested from the noise uh, consultant. So um, that's where we are with this. So again, we'll talk about that will be the second part if you want to choose uh, alternative 
um, equipment to go in the existing SkyTrack location. So Dale, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, one option would be to select equipment to go in place of where the SkyTrack is, but possibly hold off on the location of SkyTrack pending clarification of the ordinance? Is that an option? No, I think we, you need to make a decision and give some guidance to the council at this point in time. That's what about my recommendation. Okay. Commissioner Marigo. So are we looking for a motion? Because I, I have a motion. I'll see if it gets seconded. Sure. I move that we leave the SkyTrack with based on the information that we have from tonight's meeting, we leave the SkyTrack where it is. Is there a second? Can I just clarify one thing before anybody else wants to chime in? Can you, Dale, can you confirm why the SkyTrack is locked up at this point and not being used? It's because of the complaints we've heard uh, unable to keep people off of it um, and uh, calls for service for, um, and people using it all times of night. We do our best, but as you saw in the earlier reports, we've had it vandalized many times. So it does take some time to go out there and lock it up. So we figure it was the best interest to have the commissioners review the um, locations as alternative locations. If the commission decides to move it to another location in the park, there still may be, we still may need to lock it up at night, but I think um, we wouldn't get as many complaints and or uh, we would have better eyes on it being especially closer to the aquatics facility. Mr. Hurt. Yes, I, uh, uh, seeing how the previous motion did not appear to attract a second, I, I would like to offer a motion. Um, and it is that, uh, I mean, I, we've seen the survey results. We've seen that uh, the SkyTrack is, uh, is well liked by a, a strong majority of the of the neighbor, neighboring residents. Uh, we've seen the uh, studies which show that uh, uh, although it may be debatable uh, about the noise levels at adjoining residences in the current location, it would be significantly lower if moved to the middle of the park. So therefore, I think we can satisfy both uh, the concerns and the uh, desires of the neighborhood by uh, relocating the sky track to location B, and I make that motion. I would second that. Right, and I missed who seconded that. Uh, Tony Marigo. Okay. All right. Any discussion on the motion? Commissioner Hurt, can you um, clarify why you picked B over C? You know, I just personally don't have a strong preference of B over C, and I would be happy to amend it for C if someone else does. I just think the 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 proximity to the pool and the ability of staff to to monitor and if necessary at night to lock it up that's a that's a better location for them. But again, I don't have a real strong feeling. Be overseen. Uh, Someone does. I would welcome that input, and I'd be willing to amend the motion. For for this discussion wise, why I'm not a fan of C is because it's right next to the soccer field, and I think that it would be too distracting for kids that are playing soccer um, to see this right next to them. It's just a little bit further with B, and I think a B is a good alternative to go there. I also want to just take into consideration where trees are and other existing, you know, park amenities are right in those two areas. So without knowing specifically exactly in between what trees or whatever, I would feel comfortable with either one, like specif clarifying it to B or C just to make sure. 
Marika, are you suggesting that the motion be amended to that we not provide at this time a specific? I would just, to the yeah, council? I would, I would just ask that it would be amended to B or C. Well, one of the things that I was, one of the comments from the community was that the noise from the sky track would be uh, somehow disturbing to people having swim lessons and things of that sort, which is why actually I was going to ask why B and not C. But on the other hand, if at C it would be disturbing to, to uh, people playing soccer, uh, that's another story, I guess. I'm not clear which would be preferable um, in that sense uh, for in terms of other activities in those areas. Does anybody I, have a sense of that? I the only the only sense I have is when I it was probably about a month ago that I walked out there and I walked around the whole area and that was the only thing I noticed on C was that it was right next to the soccer field and I'm looking where the kids warm up and I just I was like wow I don't really want them getting distracted by it that's the only reason I I, I like B better than C. Okay. I, I think I think one thing to take into consideration when we're looking at if it's B or C is that. I would be more concerned about the residential noises rather than the temporary park noises, right, of the pool or the soccer field. Those people get to leave at the end of the period of time and not be distracted by that while the people that actually live there have to experience the sound. So that would be my only, you know, comment of picking a location of B or C is like, where is it further furthest from people's houses? to prevent further nuisances. So we're not in a situation like we are now. Dale, I had one question uh, before we vote on this motion. Uh, the picnic area that's being developed, is that closer to C or B? It is closer to B. Okay. It's just south of it. So that's one reason why staff had recommended. Staff recommends B because it's all in one area, uh, especially if you're with a family, you have kids right there, you're able to um, supervise them, especially for playing on other amenities. Whereas um, C is a little more challenging. It's on the other side of the path and as you know, little ones kind of wander. Um, also staff recommends uh, B also because there is piece of artwork by C. It's not ideal uh, to have that um, amenity next to it because you want a, a 360 view of the, the spaceship out there. So that's why staff recommends the B location over the C location. Right, I see B would be uh, better in regards to location to the other playground equipment. All right, any further discussion on the motion? All right. Uh, Commissioner Chambers? Aye. Commissioner Hurt? Aye. Commissioner Marigo? Aye. Commissioner Siegel? Aye. Commissioner Bing? No. And I'll vote yes. So the motion passes. And that's that's a, a, to move to B, right? I mean, we're yes. talking about following the staff yeah, recommendation. That, that was the motion. The motion remained B, yeah. Yes. Okay. All right, thank you everyone for your comments and your attention. And we'll move on to the second part of this, Dale. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Ono. So the next part of it is to replace the existing SkyTrack. So as I mentioned before, we did a survey um, we have two choices, um, new play equipment. So the current uh, item on, on before you, the obstacle course, we had 150 or 39% of the residents stated that they prefer obstacle course B. Uh, this would fit in the existing SkyTrack uh, uh, footprint at this time. Next slide, please. The other choice was 100 or 101 or 26% of the residents stated they prefer the natural or net play equipment. So if you go by what the residents had said, it would be the obstacle course, but I thought I'd throw both of these out there to see if the commission would like to follow along with the residents as stated, or if you have a different uh, selection or recommendations. Commissioner Hurd. Oh, I'm sorry. I, 
did not mean to keep my hand up. Okay, Commissioner Ving. Yeah, I just wondered if uh, the city staff have any uh, suggestions or recommendations on this. I feel like I'm the last person to uh, choose between option A or option B, but um, are there any considerations that you all think we should have in mind for? I, um, can, you, can you go back to the previous slide, please, obstacle course? I think this might attract your young teens. I don't think we have any, uh, besides the Skytrack, I think this would be uh, something for the older youth slash teens. I think they would get uh, really enjoy doing kind of like the ninja course type thing because that's still kind of like on TV, people still attract to that. Um, it seems the other equipment is more preschoolish type thing. So this is what we would recommend. But again, we're open to get consideration from the commission on your feedback on this. And, and Dale, how does that relate to my recollection is that there's some existing uh, playground type equipment uh, nearby? Yes, we actually have a tot playground, which is geared for two to five year olds that has uh, expression swings, it has a little uh, play area as well as some uh, rockers. We also have a primary, which is geared for five to 12 year olds, including a rock climbing wall, um, a climbing wall that's in the shape of a whale, um, slides and, and basically um, a disc swing out there. So that is geared for those ages. So this would probably fit kind of, like I said, the younger, you know, the older kids would be more geared towards. And I think that would be a good fit. And we can certainly work also, this is not necessarily the same colors. We can certainly go with the same color scheme that is out there too, to, to match it. So it doesn't stick out too much. Great, thank you. Commissioner Marigo. So going off of Dale's experience on this and really listening to the community, on what they voted. I think it's very important that we listen to the community and 36% of the respondents said they want something of the obstacle course. I think having the tot next to it would um, give a, a good balance to all the kids in the area of parents that have both young kids and a little bit older kids. Um, I do like the idea of going to the color scheme to making those match just for being, being able to look at that. Having something being a little bit the same, I think is a better, I don't know, more pleasing to the eye if you care about that stuff. But um, I, I definitely think listening to the public um, on this is very important. Right, I agree. Commissioner Chambers. Um, so I just wanna second that. And I think it's important to listen to the people that are going to use the park. I also know that the other one has like a lot more climbing features and there's already that kind of existing rock climbing wall type thing that people can climb. So something that's more um, horizontal might be more appeasing to different crowds that don't want to necessarily vertically climb. So thank you. That's all. Thanks. All right. Should we open this up to public comment? Yes. Do we have anyone who would like to speak in the, from the attendees this evening? I do not show any raise hands at this time for public comments. All right, let's close public comment. Is there any other discussion on this item? If not, I have a feeling we're ready to entertain a motion. Would someone like to make that? I believe Commissioner uh, Mauricio actually made the um, made it in. I think uh, Chambers seconded. I believe. Oh, okay, I missed that. Right. So let's take a vote on that. Uh, Commissioner Siegel. Mr. Chair, hold sure. on. Can you oh. repeat the motion? I'm not sure we had a motion. I think we yeah, had this on the previous. I didn't time. actually hear it phrased in the form of making a motion. Um, so okay. perhaps someone. Well, can ought, can someone, the chair I think, repeat it then? I think someone ought to form. I think maybe Tony could formally re-express what he said in the form I, of a motion. 
I, I'm happy to do that. Can we go to, I wanna make sure I get the right um, thing. Go back to B. I think it's B, if I'm correct. Yes. So I'm, I move that we, in place of the SkyTrack, we put obstacle course B um, with, I'm gonna put in there with the complementing colors of what is existing and near the area. I second. Thank you. So we have a motion on the table. We have seconded. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and vote. Commissioner Vink? Aye. Commissioner Siegel? Aye. Commissioner Marigo? Aye. Commissioner Hurt? Aye. Commissioner Chambers? Aye. And I'll vote yes as well. So we have obstacle course B going in where the sky truck was formerly located. All right. With that, is there anything else that you're asking for, Dale, tonight? No, I think that's everything. You've selected the equipment and we received public input, that was, which there was none regarding um, the replacement equipment. So I think we are good. Well, then we'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll make that motion that we second. adjourn this evening. I'll second that. Okay. Commissioner Chambers? Aye. Commissioner Hurt? Aye. Commissioner LaFleur? Oops, not here. Commissioner Marigo? Aye. Commissioner Siegel? Aye. Commissioner Vink? Aye. And I vote yes as well. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. Thank you, Good night all. Thank you for your Thank hard you. work on this. Good Thank night. you. Stay Thank cool. You.